So welcome to day three of the Stress Release Challenge for December. We have a very special guest today, Patty Perper DeVries, who is a wellness expert, and she has some amazing information to share with us today. So Patty, I'll let you take it. Thank you, Liz. So nice to be here with all of you today. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about our thoughts, about some toolkits and some tools that I've used throughout my lifetime to create a really spectacular life, I believe, for myself and also for those around me who get to interact on a day-to-day -day basis. So before we start, I just want to take a moment um, because we are so hard on ourselves, especially in this current time in our lives and in the world's history. So I want you to remember that you're so hard on yourself. Please take a moment, sit back, marvel at your life, at the grief that has softened you, at the heartache that has wisened you, at the suffering that strengthened you. And despite everything, you still grow. Be proud of this. And I am very thankful that you're here today listening to this because that shows that growth mindset. And I appreciate you being here. So my happiness toolkit, I've been collecting things that make me happy for many years. As a young child, I grew up in a household where things weren't always calm. Um, in fact, they were, they were pretty volatile a fair amount of the time. Um, my dad drank a lot and my mom you know, still suffers from some mental illness. And so from a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis, I learned to soothe myself in a lot of ways to find things that would create a curiosity, in, a curiosity in me that would fuel my focus to learn more. So my happiness toolkit includes a lot of things, including being outside in nature, moving my body to move some of the energy that gets stored in, from emotions, to grant forgiveness, not necessarily to someone else, but towards someone else so that I can relieve any of the pain and discomfort that I feel from whatever may have transpired between me and another. I use self-compassion in all of my daily activities these days and certainly gratitude for all those who are in my life and the circumstances. I like to focus on my strengths, feel the connection that comes from being close to other human beings. I love to be cre creative, which I get from using all these other tools. And my most recent tool that I've discovered and found the words for is called neural literacy. So as I go into these, and I will touch base on some of them as I go further, I want to start with a video that has been really impactful in my life and hopefully will help you understand where I'm coming from on my journey to well-being. Location, location, location. Brought to you by the Conscious Leadership Group. Find them on the web at www.conscious.is. Animation by Graham Franks, www.grahamfranks.com. One question that conscious leaders ask themselves over and over is, where am I? To support leaders in locating themselves as they ask the question, where am I? We offer this tool, a line, a simple black line. At any moment, all leaders and all people are either above the line or below the line. Our location describes how we're being with what is occurring in our life right now. If we're above the line, we are open, curious, and committed to learning. If we are below the line, we are closed, defensive, and committed to being right. Stop right now and simply ask yourself, where am I? In this now moment, am I above the line or below the line? Typically, when people are below the line, they believe certain things about the world. For example, they believe there is not enough. It could be that there's not enough money or time or space or energy or love. People below the line also believe that their story about the situation is right. People below the line also believe that there is a threat out there. Something or someone is threatening their desire for approval, control or security. And people below the line see the situation as serious. The deeper below the line they are, the more serious things look. People below the line tend to behave certain ways as well. They tend to cling to an opinion, find fault and blame, gossip, explain, rationalize and justify, get overwhelmed, and avoid conflict or pursue conflict for the sake of winning. When people are above the line, they believe that learning and growing are more important than being right. 
They believe that all people and circumstances are their allies, here for their growth. They believe that from a distance, almost everything is funny. People above the line live in curiosity, listen deeply, speak unarguably, question all their beliefs, and live a life of play. Now, knowing what you know about being above or below the line, where are you? One thing to know as you consider this question, we're hardwired to go below the line. Literally, our brain is programmed to perceive threat, and when it does, a chemical cocktail courses through our veins, and we go below the line. This reaction was designed to help us survive in the presence of a real threat to our physical survival. An issue for modern day leaders is that often our brains can't tell the difference between a threat to our physical survival and a threat to our ego or identity. We react and get defensive when we experience a threat to our ego. So in many ways, being below the line is natural and normal. But when we are below the line, we're not in a state, literally brain state, of high creativity, collaboration, innovation, and relational connection. We're simply trying to survive. Leaders today can't thrive if they're in survival mode. So the first activity of conscious leadership is location, location, location. In this now moment, where am I? Telling ourselves and others the truth about our current location begins the great conversation. So I believe all of us are leaders, whether we lead a team, an organization, or are a leader within our family, or just leading our own lives. Thinking um, in a way that helps us be more above the line will be beneficial to our lives. It increases our energy, it increases our playfulness, it increases our flexibility in all areas of our lives. And so for me, I like to put things in the most basic terms to help me remember and to help me make simplicity out of my life and create a life of play for myself and those around me. I love being curious. I love being playful. I love being creative. And when I'm above the line, acting in a way that is without fear and more in a place of love and curiosity, my life just automatically seems to get better with every turn. What I'd love for you is to just take a moment wherever you are and write down three words that describe you at your best. When you're above the line and you feel energy and enthusiasm for life, what? how would you describe yourself to somebody that may be listening? And Liz, since you've organized all these things, I would love to hear what your three words are that describe you at your best. When I'm at my best, I feel energized, usually about like some new information that I've learned that I want to share with someone or when I'm spending time with my kids and maybe we just have that moment where all three of us see a deer out in nature and we're just in that state of awe together. Oh, look at that. I feel I'm at my best in those moments. I'm also at my best when I actually take time to relax. When I'm laying out on the beach with my feet in the sand, turning into my inner world and just listening to the water, I'm truly at my best. I'm so relaxed and I really enjoy those moments. So beautiful. I know you're also at your best because I've been with you when we're brainstorming about how to share our best practices with others, how to learn and grow together. And those I see you just glowing when, again, you're learning, when you're engaged in the natural world. And I think for me, um, adults, many of us have lost that essence of play where we get to get outside with someone to be our best to play, whether it's in the forest when we went on a hike or just getting outside and, and thinking creatively. Um, to me, those are the best, the best play dates with my adult friends is when we get to um, come together, maybe create something together, whether it's ideas or a craft or um, just how we want to live our lives. It's one of my, my favorite things. So thank you for sharing those things with us, Liz. When we're above the line and we're in those states and we're at our best, our heart um, also responds positively. And when we think about heart rate variability that has been researched extensively by HeartMath, when we're above the line as described in the video, 
our heart rate is just smooth and you can see it and yet and you can see where our heart rate goes and that variability when we're frustrated it becomes jagged and incongruent and what we want to do is think about that in terms of the science about it because it's fairly easy to get above the line when we're mindful about what we're thinking about and how we're feeling on our day-to-day -day basis when we're also above the line, um, and I've taken this research um, from many, many of the people that have done research, this particular um, set of uh, information is from the University of Virginia, but I took it because it does talk about positive energizers and de-energizers, which has also been uh, studied by Kim Cameron and uh, Dr. Baker. And when we're above the line as a positive energizer and described in the video, we help others flourish, we're trustworthy and we have integrity, we're dependable, we use abundance language, we're helpful and we're genuine and, and authentic because we're not defending ourselves, we're not looking for a danger, we can feel safe and we can feel free to express ourselves. When we're below the line, we see mostly roadblocks, we create problems because we're afraid of, of change. We don't allow others to be values because we're so worried about valuing ourselves and making sure we're seen. We can be inflexible in our thinking when we're below the line and we don't always show concern for others, not because we don't care about others, but simply because we are more concerned about getting our own needs met. And so we often don't follow through either. Again, sometimes fear gets in our way. And so I choose to live my life as often as possible, being a positive energizer and living above the line. Also some key findings um, are those who positively energize others are higher performers. They surround themselves with others and they lift them up. Positive energizers tend to enhance the performance of others and people who interact with or are connected to these energizers also perform better. And last, high-performing organizations have three times more positive energizers than low-performing organizations. My goal is to work with positive energizers within organizations to help them see that simply by making an effort to be above the line and living their best life, living as the best person, their best version of themselves, we can change organizations. And it's going to happen just one person at a time being able to live above the line. And when groups decide to live above the line, work together to lift each other up, it can have powerful effects. So again, it's just a reminder to where often we are, especially in this day and age, we are you know, confronted with the news, we are confronted with um, communities of fear and there is um, you know, widespread just distrust of a lot of people in today's world. And we can start to change that when we decide to live a life above the line and start trusting even a little bit and looking for the good in all people. I haven't come by this just overnight. And there's a lot of information here and this is a simple video, but I started to look a little bit deeper and how our thoughts and how we look at things and how our fears and the way we look at the world impacts our lives. I started reading a lot of books as I spent time in nature a few years ago. And some of the books I read were How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, Change Your Thoughts, Change Your Life by Wayne Dyer, and certainly some other books, including the Tao Te Ching, Becoming Supernatural, which has a lot to do with our thoughts, and Living in the Life by Shakti Gawain. These were all very influential for me over the past few years as I started looking at the way my thoughts impact my productivity in life and how I show up in the world. It certainly came with a lot of inner confrontation, inner dialogue, and a real looking to see how I want to show up in the world based on my values and my historical context. Some of the daily reminders that I came to that I wanna share with you because I believe that they're vital is that the first one is that it's important, I believe, for all of us to recognize our value, to recognize that we all have a spark inside of us that gives us life. And that same spark is in all, all living beings. And once we realize how special that is, Oftentimes after we lose a loved one and we realize the fragility of life and how important it is to love you know, a loved one while they're here, oftentimes when we lose that loved one, that's when we start to really recognize the value of life and how important relationships are. Secondly, um, 
I found it really important to start to inventory my strengths and opportunities, not necessarily just to feel better about myself, but oftentimes that has that impact, but most importantly, so that I can start to realize how I can use my strengths and find opportunities in the world to give my gifts back and to share them with others that may want to learn from me through my words or my actions or what I create. Third is that I chose to select my mindset on a day-to-day -day basis, to choose to have a growth mindset, to trust until proven that I can't, and to create um, positive relationships with all those around me. Having an open mindset, a growing mindset, a curious mindset certainly has served me my life. Lastly, it's really important that each of us find a way to share our gifts and I believe when we share the gifts that we have and we do it from the heart and we do it from our point of where we understand our values, that we can start to really enjoy life to its fullest. We can start creating boundaries for ourselves for those things that don't align with these areas of life. If they don't align with my values, I say no. If they don't align with what my strengths are and the opportunities I see for sharing my gifts with the world in a positive manner, it's easy to say no now that I've found these things for myself. Now, I don't stay above the line all the time. And as many as you have, many of you may know, we can choose to stay above the line, but then something unexpected will bring us back below the line. We all know that those days when we were so excited, maybe we just graduated from a new course and we're excited to share the information, or maybe we got a promotion at work or you know, met a new friend and we get really excited. And then we go out and somebody dings our car or, or cuts us off in traffic and we end up dropping below the line and reacting in a way that we are sometimes even really surprised about. And where did that come from? And I can't believe I said that. I can't believe I did that. You know, where did that happen? And that's when we go below the line. And so what I started to wonder as I was out in the hillside for many hours of many days of the past few years is how do I start to learn more about my operating system, about the way my brain works and how do these just random, you know, outbursts or, a, you know, a good cry, where do they come from? And why can I always later figure out whether I was tired and they happen or maybe whether one of my passions got uh, poked in, in a certain way. And it's fun to get curious, to start understanding how my brain works and how it can work better through my thoughts. I have a short video to show you that hopefully will explain it much better than I can. Here is a human brain. What are not shown in this image are neurons. The brain contains lots of neurons, billions and billions of them. There are more than 80 billion in most human brains. Neurons are cells that transmit and receive information via electrochemical signals. These signals are passed from neuron to neuron at the synapse of each cell, the area where two neurons meet. Each neuron has between 5,000 and 15,000 connections to other neurons. A group of neurons that fire together in a particular sequence is called a pattern. Neurons that fire together, wire together. In other words, the more frequently two neurons activate in sequence, the more they are likely to wire together in patterns of activation. Every function of your brain is the result of patterns of neurons firing. These patterns firing in your brain both influence and are influenced by the way you experience life. These patterns play an enormous role in how we experience our day-to-day -day lives. So for me, it certainly does as well. It influences many areas of my life. And in fact, I, I haven't yet found an area where it hasn't positively influenced how I show up in the world. So neuroplasticity is the property of the brain to change its form, its structure, and its function through experiences and activities across our lifespan. Until about 2007, scientists believed that our brain, once developed, didn't change much until, until it started to decline in old age. We now know that we can change our brain, not just through our life experiences, 
but by proactively engaging in a dialogue with ourselves to understand how our brain works and how to make it better using our mind. To do that, and I'll start you on a simple process that you can start thinking about if this is of interest to you. To start with a definition that brain patterns are not just thoughts. So brain patterns and thoughts are not exactly the same thing because brain patterns are thoughts plus the emotions that go with it. And we can oftentimes feel emotions before we, that we recognize a thought, but they're always part of the equation. We will have bodily sensations that come with those emotions. And we also will react with behaviors because at our essence, we want to feel good. We want to find a way to feel better about ourselves and our environment to be able to lead a good life. So for me, I learned this, um, I started looking at it more closely by looking at some of my patterns. And the biggest pattern I uncovered, even though I've been successful in my life and I've tried a lot of things and I've learned a lot of things and I've had a spectacular life, is that underneath it all, I found an, a level of unworthiness that I hadn't really recognized before. That is what I named my overall pattern that I kept seeing over and over again. The thoughts that would come with this is that I haven't done enough. I'm not enough. You know, when I was younger and I was an athlete and I ended up um, going to Stanford on a full athletic scholarship and I ended up going to the Olympic trials, but through it all with every success, the mantra was that was good, but what are we gonna do next? And so I never stopped to celebrate any successes. And I felt that there was always something I needed to do next. So I wasn't able to enjoy my successes. The emotions I felt were often sadness and anxiety because that deep seated feeling of unworthiness followed me wherever I went. And the bodily sensations is that my throat would get tight, my upset stomach would get upset, but it wasn't just in athletics. It was in my career. It was in a day-to-day -day in a meeting Okay, did I say that enough? Can I speak up? Because down below the surface, even though I looked successful from the outside, I wasn't celebrating my successes on the inside because I had never learned to do this. What I'm learning is that we can now change these things so that our behaviors can be different. My behavior, when I would have these feelings of un unworthiness that would pop up in almost every situation over time, is that I would either leave the situation or almost desperately seek approval for love or praise. Throughout all that time, and I wanna just put this up for all of you, throughout all that time, I learned a lot about myself, a lot about the thoughts and emotions that were tied together, the bodily sensations of anxiety that lived with me for so long, and then the behaviors that would come of it. Now for you, and, and feel free to, to take a screenshot of this because I think this is such a simple yet powerful way to get started on the path of neural literacy. You may start with a behavior. If there's a behavior that you're not proud of, you don't wanna be part of, that you don't wanna do anymore, start with the behavior. You don't have to start at the top and move down. You can start with the behavior that you're looking at. What happens, what bodily sensations rise for you? right before you do something that you don't want to do. For me, and, and this may tie really well with your series, Liz, is that for me, I want some sugar. And that sugar is usually, you know, that, that decision to go get or find some sugar in the house usually starts with this bodily sensation of either, you know, boredom or a little bit of anxiety that something's going wrong and I want something to do. And it rarely is that I'm actually hungry. And so I start looking at those bodily sensations and the emotions that come and the thoughts that come up. And oftentimes it's that boredom, it's that thought of, oh, who cares? You know, if I gain a few pounds, what does it matter? Instead of looking at sugar as the fuel that fuels this body that I've been given. And, it, and to take another look at it, instead of saying, why bother and who cares? I'll just have the sugar, I'll feel good for you know the next half hour. Instead, I can take a different viewpoint, step back a little bit and start paying attention to what my body really needs, which is usually some water, some fresh nutrients, something to fuel me for my next adventure. And when I start to look at my behaviors and my thoughts, and I start feeling those things that make me feel below the line, I can start looking at my dialogue. What are the words I'm saying? What are the 
thoughts that I'm having? What is causing me to move below the line? And then as Byron Katie says, and she's one of my, my favorite people in the whole world, she may say, is it true? So for instance, you may think, oh, my boss just doesn't care. Well, is that true? And have you had a conversation where your boss said he didn't care or might you are having struggling at the time with not feeling cared for by yourself? Oftentimes when I am not feeling heard, I realize that it's I'm not listening to myself. When I'm not feeling cared for by someone in the outside world, the reality is when I look deeper, it's because I'm not caring enough for myself. When I'm not feeling heard by someone else, it's simply a matter of turning that inward and realizing that I am not listening to myself in that situation. And in all those cases, I find myself having those thoughts and those emotions that drag me back below the line into that place of seeking control or approval or gossiping to try to make myself somehow feel better, which if you have been there before, you know that never works. And so I start looking at those things and realizing that I can change it by changing my beliefs about the situation, giving my boss the benefit of the doubt, looking at all the ways he has shown he has cared or she has cared over the years, and to really look at those thoughts, emotions, and all of those things that have brought me below the line time and time again, so that I can make a different choice in what I believe and how I feel in the future. Through a process of learning neural literacy through a company called Next, I created what I call, you know, more of an enhanced wellness wheel. They call it a life context. And I look at it and was able to identify that the patterns in my life and the themes in my life have really been around life being as art or as creative expression. And so now everything I look at in my life, I look at through a lens of connection and oneness, of vitality of creative expression and beauty surrounding myself in all those areas. These are the areas that are important to me. And, and you can create something similar, which with a pen and a paper, what is the overarching theme that brings you joy? For me, it's creating art in conversations, in my presentations, in my outside world, on the land, when I communicate with others in all my relationships. I wanna create the most beautiful relationship and love life that I can create in all things. I created a vision board and not your normal vision board that you might see on you know, some of the talk shows or some of the working, the, the shows that you may see or workshops. It's not about what I want in terms of any material thing, but it's about how I want to feel. I want to feel that worthiness. I wanna feel the love of my family. I want to take care of that little girl that was a, a little girl who was afraid of many things when I was younger. And I wanna create a life, a beautiful expression. When I get up every morning, seeking to feel that energy and that joy in day to day living, I find joy in everything that I do. I love this quote by George Bernard Shaw, which is imagination is the beginning of creation. When we start to imagine all that is possible in our lives, when we start to imagine all the things that we can do when we set our mind to it. I know that we are the writer, the director, and the leading performer in the play that is our lives. And play is an intentional word because I believe that's what it is. We can choose to show up in any way we want, and we can choose to create things of beauty. Whether it's this wellness wheel that was inspired by Don Miguel Ruiz and, the, and this medicine bag, or just simple works of art on the land or in a presentation, or whether you write or draw or create magical performances, or even a team meeting. A team meeting can be a magical creative space for learning when we put our, our heart and soul into it. I believe that our relationships are works of art. They grow with us. They mature with us. We can add beauty to them. We can add beauty to all those around us and connect other people in intricate dances of energy and alignment. One of my visions for the future is that so many of us start to decide to learn to be neuroliterate, to take control of our thoughts and our reactions to the world, and to start living a life where we blossom and grow and share those tools and skills with others. I would love nothing more than to live in a community, in a country, in a world 
where we are surrounded by goodness and, and blossoming and lighting the world from the inside out. This quote by Maya Angelou is one of my favorites. I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. When we stay above the line, we make people feel amazing. When we go about below the line is when we lash out and when we criticize and we put ourselves in a place of judgment. I want to live a life as Maya Angelou would have felt. And I hope all of you feel that today. I wanna leave you with this beautiful namaste. My soul honors your soul. I honor the place in you where the entire universe resides. I honor the light, love, truth, beauty, and the peace within you because it is also within me. In sharing these things, we are united. We are the same. We are one. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope to hear from some of you and let me know if you ever want to learn more. Thank you so much, Liz, for having me today. Thank you, Patty. You're always an inspiration to me, and I love the relationship that we're creating together. And this was so relevant for um, our stress release challenge for the past three days. So much great information on how to address what's happening in our bodies, become self-aware of our patterns and our emotions, and what things that we can do to go ahead and increase our, elevate our emotions and live the beautiful life that we all want to live. So in the email, follow-up email today, I will go ahead and post information how people can reach you. And um, I see your email is there and a little bit more information about the next system as well. So thank you so much for joining us, Patty. Thank you, Liz, as always. I hope to see you soon. <laughs> Absolutely.